these events is evident in partnership between the European Union, EU, and the Caribbean Research Institute. Testing, testing, challenges to social programs for at-risk youth is an output of the EU-funded project, Civil Society Organizations as Actors of Governance and Development. The research focuses on youths, which is a priority group for the EU under this project. Following the opening remarks, we will have the presentation of the research findings by Ms. Joanna Cullen, lead researcher at Capri on the report. We have brought together the Honorable Horace Chang, Minister of National Security, and Professor Anthony Clayton, Professor of Caribbean Sustainable Development, to join the discussion, which will be moderated by Dr. Diana Thorburn, Capri's Director of Research. I am Nicole Walker, Director of Programs at the Caribbean Policy Research Institute, and welcome to this evening's event. Let's welcome the EU's ambassador to Jamaica, Marianne Van Steen, to give greetings. Good evening um, to everyone. I'm very pleased to be present here for the launch of this new research of Capri. And this in the company of a very um, distinguished panel. Let me acknowledge the presence to this activity of the most honorable Dr. Oris Chang, the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of National Security, also of Professor Anthony Clayton, Professor at the Institute for Sustainable Development at the University of the West Indies, Dr. Diana Torburn, Director of Research at Capri, and also in particular, uh, Mrs. Joanna Callan, who is the lead researcher of um, the research we're gonna hear everything about tonight. I'm very much looking forward to hear these results. Um, and I think this is extremely important because it's on an issue which is of main concern for all Jamaican citizens, notably the high level of crime and violence that affect the lives of, our, of us all and how to better protect the young generation, especially the most vulnerable. The European Union is proud to be co-funding organizations like CAPRI. Um, the project name has been mentioned, civil society organizations as actors of governance and development. Um, these kind of projects make this kind of research um, possible. And um, we actually do think um, that is, uh, I mean, extremely important that, or even like an honor for us that we can contribute to that. Um, what the research aims at is to enhance indeed governance and accountability by stimulating policy innovation and improving the responsiveness of policies in the specific areas of empowerment of women, children, and youth. Through the support um, to this kind of projects, the European Union wishes to strengthen the role of civil society, helping to ensure that its expertise advances the quality of policy making and the quality of legislative work. And this, of course, in the interest of the entire society. Thereby, the European Union aims to promote more effective democratic control, oversight, transparency. Consulting and involving civil society should indeed, according to us, be standard practice in development in general, um, but also, and in particular, uh, in this particular uh, context, um, in our development activities um, in order to monitor security policies and um, activities. This is what we are focusing on um, a lot here in Jamaica. Actually, recently we have stepped up our support to both the government and to civil society to enhance increased um, citizen security, including legitimacy, good governance, accountability, and sustainability of the citizen security sector initiatives. The project um, of, I mean, we have with Capri is just uh, one of the many initiatives that we are supporting. Our support and the research that will be presented later on um, 
contributes directly to the objectives of Vision 2030, Jamaica National Development Plan, and the Global 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. In particular, it's Goal 16, which um, is prom about promoting peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development. And within all this the research of tonight, um, I mean, of which we will hear the results tonight, focus in particular on youth, because young people are agents of development and change, and as such, they are essential contributors to the 2030 agenda. Um, neglecting their education, their employment, their political, their social needs would undermine the achievement of the SDGs and would leave them vulnerable to crime and radical. Most Honourable Dr. Aris Chang, as panelist tonight, is very welcome and highly appreciated as it is an additional assurance of the commitment of the government of Jamaica to enhance evidence-based decision-making. Thank you so much for being here. I'm not going to extend um, or take more time with you um, as much as you're looking forward to hear the results of the study and also to hear um, the panel discussing about this. Um, important um, topic for uh, Jamaica. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador Van Steen. We're very happy to have you with us. I think this is your first Capri event since you have come to Jamaica, so welcome. We're really happy for the partnership and that you are able to join us as we continue this partnership. My name is Diana Thorburn. I'm the Director of Research at Capri, and I'm going to be moderating the panel discussion this evening. Just to give you a little overview of the rest of the forum, we will have the presentation uh, followed by two minute responses from each of the two panelists. And then we will go into the question and answer. Tonight, we're going to be using Slido for our questions from the public. You can go on any browser, your phone, your computer, iPad, laptop, to slido.com, enter the event code CAPRI. You can post questions or vote up questions, and you can also participate in our polls. In fact, there is a poll question there now, which we would like you to go ahead and answer, and answer it now because the answer is going to be in <laughs> Joanna's presentation. Um, so you can go ahead and do that. So without any further, I'm going to hand it over to Joanna. Joanna, presentation. Thank you, Diana. A well-known management practitioner once said, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. And I think if it's one thing we can all agree on, it's that we want to improve Jamaica's citizen security situation. Between fiscal years 2007, 2008 and 2017, 2018, an estimated 387 billion Jamaican was spent on youth programs. Comparatively for the same time period, 898 billion was spent on education. Still, Jamaica continues to experience some of the highest rates of crime and violence in the world and the highest per capita murder rate in the Latin America and Caribbean region. Now, the main perpetrators are young males of 35 years of age who are usually undereducated and for this reason, often not employed in the formal sector. Now, between 2013 and 2018, males under the age of 35 represented 77% of those arrested and charged with a category one crime. This population also accounted for 80% of homicide victims. And if you want to know how dire our situation is, we have 12 year old children who are being arrested for murder. The group of persons who often become involved in crime and violence are often referred to by stakeholders as at-risk youth. 
But who is an at-risk youth? There are several terms that are often used interchangeably by stakeholders. At-risk youth, high-risk youth, or unattached youth. And while I won't go into the nuances of the differences this evening, for today's presentation, youth are thought to be at risk when there is an increased likelihood of them becoming a perpetrator or victim of crime and violence. Many of these at-risk youth are the focus of social interventions. Social interventions are best understood as the active involvement in the lives of the persons that are vulnerable to participating or becoming entrenched in gangs or criminal groups. With positive behavior change often being the overarching objective of these interventions, whether through skills training, psychosocial services, or life skills training. But do we know which interventions have succeeded? It's difficult to answer this question because of systemic challenges that exist with the monitoring and evaluation of these social interventions. They tend to be weak, that is, it may be missing components vital for measuring the program, and that is if they have a framework at all. They're often operating without coordination or collaboration, and they are sometimes time-bound and not designed for sustainability. Now, there are two prominent examples of programs which have experienced challenges with monitoring and evaluation prior to this report. The HART National Service and Training Agency. In, two, in September 2020, a Auditor General report revealed that the institution had significant challenges to monitoring its at-risk youth program, despite acknowledging that there were weaknesses in the framework. The Citizen Security and Justice Program which happens to be Jamaica's longest running intervention program, ran for three phases. The first two phases ran without proper monitoring and evaluation. However, by the third phase, the stakeholders learned and adapted, establishing a monitoring and evaluation unit, which allowed them to begin measuring some of the successes of their interventions. Now, these challenges that exist are not a new discovery. There have been multiple reports that have acknowledged, outlined, and even offered recommendations to address the challenges. These reports include a 2017 National Youth Policy, a 2012 Youth Situation Analysis, and the 2016 National Policy on Poverty Reduction. So why are we still here? Now, there are some basic components that are needed to know what works. In the analysis of the programs that we'll be examining this evening, a United Nations Framework Guide was used to assist develop four analysis questions. Did they have a framework? Was there a theory of change or results chain used? Was a baseline assessment done? Was there a data collection process? And as an added part, we examined for collaboration. There were 10 programs that were examined during the course of the research. Now, before I discuss the findings, it should be made clear that this report in no way evaluates the efficacy of these programs, the efficacy of the components that were actually examined in the report, nor, do they, nor are these the only components that are actually needed for a well-designed framework. Of the 10 programs that were looked at, eight had frameworks while two had none. Seven developed their interventions using a theory of change or a results chain. Eight of the 10 programs use baseline assessments, while eight 
also had data collection processes, baseline assessments, and data collection processes are vital to be, to be able to measure and monitor a program. Five of the 10 programs examined a clear intent to collaborate with other stakeholders. The weakest programs appear to be those that were government run, funded, and implemented. However, during the course of the research, another challenge and issue became apparent, transparency and accountability. How many interventions have we had over the last several decades? Which social interventions may have had potential or achieved their desired results? Which have failed and why did they fail so that we don't make the same mistakes again? How do we know what works? The lack of transparency forestalls public engagement with and the understanding of the interventions. People have the right to know what programs are around them that affects them, whether directly or indirectly. Lack of transparency can equate to lack of accountability. Taxpayers should know how their tax dollars are being used in the name of social change programs. From the challenges that were identified, several recommendations have been made. The first is that the creation and maintenance of a central coordination unit for social or anti-violence interventions. This should be implemented and maintained by the Citizen Security Secretariat. The recent establishment of the Secretariat to monitor the implementation of the Citizen Security Plan is an opportunity to create a central entity to coordinate social interventions. This reduces overlap, particularly where multiple interventions are underway in one community. And for understanding an intervention's place in the broader context of social programs. The second recommendation speaks to the expansion of training and the use of monitoring and evaluation and learning capacity. This recommendation fall, should fall under the purview of the performance monitoring and evaluation branch of the office, at the office of the prime minister. As a government seeks to enact a whole of government approach with its citizen security plan, efforts should be made to build the capacity across the various ministries, departments, and agencies. The performance monitoring and evaluation branch has already started working with various entities to expand their capacity. However, aside from this lack of capacity, even where agencies have requisite personnel, they are often underutilized and in many instances are not engaged at the onset of the design of the intervention. The third recommendation speaks to establishing a working group of monitoring, evaluation, and learning stakeholders supported by the requisite professionals. This effort should be led by the Citizen Security Secretariat. A working group of experts would serve two purposes. The first is to establish a network of officers who can develop a working relationship with each other to facilitate a multi-sectoral approach. Secondly, a comprehensive review can provide recommendations to address gaps in existing programs and provide guidelines that can be used by other stakeholders. The working group should also develop a toolkit that can be used to assist stakeholders in developing monitoring, evaluation, and learning frameworks. The fourth recommendation speaks to greater openness and transparency, particularly where interventions are government funded. This speaks to publicly publishing on and being accessible on websites 
where frameworks for all government supported interventions should require and should require the same of non-governmental organizations. This effort should be led by the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information. The government of Jamaica has already started this process through its Jamaica Open Data Portal. It should further go, it should go further by uploading program frameworks for all government interventions and require the same of non-governmental agencies. Whether by expanding the open data portal to include these frameworks or uploading them to a ministry website or a central website where they can be readily accessed, good governance requires open access for accountability to occur. The final recommendation this evening is a maximization of the use of geo graphic information systems in the coordination efforts. Again, the Citizen Security Secretariat would be responsible for the centralization of the social interventions. And this, they sh and this recommendation, they should also have oversight of. The United Nations Framework Guide highlights the benefits using real-time technology to monitor. The government currently uses this tool for mapping crime and violence in communities. The tool can be used to track social interventions being conducted in various communities as well as which actors are active in the community. Making the Secretariat the coordinating entity and simultaneously expanding the use of this of the geo geographic information system as a coordination tool can help to create an effective and efficient coordinating mechanism. This report is not a critique or an indictment of these programs. Leaving here today, all stakeholders should make a concerted effort to commit to designing, monitoring, evaluation, and learning frameworks so that we can measure our social, the efficacy of our social intervention programs for youths who are at risk of participating in crime and violence, thereby putting Jamaica on a path to improving our citizen security situation. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Uh, before we go into the panelists giving their initial two minute response, just like to remind our audience to go to slido.com, enter the event code Capri to post questions or vote up questions. I already see we have a few questions coming in. So please go and if you don't have a question of your own, vote up the questions that are there so that those will get answered first. I'm now going to ask our two panelists. We're very happy to have um, them with us this evening. We couldn't have asked for two better panelists to join us for this discussion to give an initial two minute uh, response to the presentation. Um, and of course, other things we'll be able to go into further along in the discussion. So we'd just like to keep this to two minutes. And I'll ask Dr. Horace Chang, Minister of National Security and Deputy Prime Minister, if he would go first and give us his two minutes. All right, thank you very much, um, Dan. Ambassador Marion Van Steen, good evening to you and your in the virtual world. Um, Prof. Clayton, good to be with you, and of course, those listening in on various um, media space across the island and in the, um, across the institutions that work in it. First, let me just commend Capri and, of course, that European Union for funding this research. In fact, this project, as a research project, is maybe a good indication of the direction the government would like to go in, because one of the critical elements over time on social intervention that they are largely not evidence-based. They were basically nice things put together to do some work. And as indicated by the research, multi-billion dollars have been spent on the social intervention. Oftentimes, the call for more money is somewhat, um, I would say, procedures, but it's, it does not recognize what is being spent. It's just because where they have failed, it's a, it's a call for more money and more money rather than to look at what is happening, identify the best practices, continue with those and look at what may be necessary 
to change to effect transformation and maintain sustainability. Um, the government have seen that and have taken some steps that should overcome some of these challenges and will look at the recommendations, not um, as part of giving indication where we should go. Clearly, one of the big issues in all of this is that over the years, despite of all these uh, you know, social outreach from youth clubs to service clubs to churches to government programs, we have had the persistent um, the social isolation by young people, in particular of in the inner city and challenged communities of referred to. So today, we know the data will suggest that not only 70% of young males are arrested for major crimes, but some 70% of our young males in challenged communities are what we call recruitable. That means they are able to get into gangs. The government therefore takes steps to ensure reverse this process, which is to ensure programs are now directed through the core services. But that's where that's what reaches the wider community first. Education, public health, social services that provide assistance to families. We have to reach them directly. And that is the new direction of the government. In that context, we will establish the citizen business group, a group all involving all the permanent secretaries and uh, head of agents to ensure that the, the government agents will be fully involved in all social investment programs. Thank you, uh, Professor Clayton, would you give your two-minute response, initial two-minute response, please? Thank you very much, Diana. This report is one of the most depressing I've read in a long time. Everything in here we've been we've been we've pretty much known for quite a long time, but to see the numbers is was just really quite harrowing. One key takeaway from this report is that over a 10 year period, 2007 to 2017, we spent $342 billion of Jamaican taxpayers' money, and this is not even including, as I understand it, support from the, our international development partners and NGO financing. You're probably not looking at much change out of half a trillion dollars. And most of this has been absolutely useless. And we know this because none of this appears to have had any effect on the key indicators, like the level of homicide. The poor are still with us. The rate of uh, violent crime has not gone down. And now when we read this report, we now start to um, understand why. That most of these projects, and there have been hundreds of them, and most of them have not been synchronized, they've not been coordinated, and uh, <clears throat> for all we know, a lot of the money has been misappropriated and misspent. But one of the key findings is that in most cases, the great majority of cases, there was no monitoring, there was no evaluation, and there was no attempt to establish baseline data. And if you don't have baseline data, you have no idea as to whether your intervention has had any effect or not. And this is a terrible indictment. It's a betrayal of the taxpayers who finance this, but even worse, it's a betrayal of the people who should have been the beneficiaries, who are the intended beneficiaries, all the people who are still in poverty, who are still suffering from lack of opportunity, and who are still suffering from violence, who should have benefited and did not do so because of the money being misallocated. One of the things that we did in the crime consensus group is that we said, that we should have a proper evaluation system for every intervention, every social intervention in this country. That the projects which had no evidence of having any kind of effect at all should be defunded. We did not say that the funding should come out of social intervention. What we said was the funding should be reallocated to the projects that actually were working because there are somewhere in this, there are projects that we believe are working. And those are the ones that need the resource. So we need to, I think, tackle some of the vested interests here. There are many people in the system who have resisted monitoring and evaluation. They don't like scrutiny. They don't like oversight. There's a lot of money that has been misspent and probably a great deal that has been misallocated. I suspect that one of the things we're looking at here is partly the effect of people who simply want to believe that their work is uh, not in vain. But there are also some people who have benefited significantly from this allocation of funding and do not want the 
money tap to be turned off. But this again is a fundamental betrayal of the people who should have been and were the intended beneficiaries. It is long overdue that we bring some proper scrutiny to this process and that we have an independent body which is charged with evaluating every social intervention and being very hard headed. The ones which are not working should be defunded as quickly as possible. And that money should be reallocated to the programs which can really make a difference to the lives of people. If we use that money for the transformation of our troubled high crime communities, then we may actually be able to start to turn this situation around and give everybody in this country a better future. I sincerely hope that this report is not lost and that the recommendations are fully taken on board and acted on. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Clayton. So we have several questions coming in and uh, Joanna, I'm just going to tell you to get prepared to talk about geographic information systems. But before we go to these questions, I think there's one question that is kind of looming over the report, even though it wasn't actually articulated. And I think now is a good time for all of our panelists to consider this question. Suppose, and I'll ask Minister Chang to go first and then everybody follow. Suppose we were just not to do any interventions at all. Suppose we were to say, we don't know if they work. Nothing has changed despite all this money, all these interventions. Suppose we just do nothing. Might that, might that, that be the same as doing all of this and spending all this money? Or maybe it might even change indicators in the direction that we want them to. Fairly, as indicated, the amount of money we've spent in the last decade in particular have not had any major impact on the issue out there. But certainly as a country, we could not say not do anything. What we need to examine what we have, and I said the issue raised by the report of having no baseline data is maybe what is frightening and, and worrying. And I think when I said this first, I got battered by a lot of public interest that I was criticizing programs. Mm -hmm. The fact is the programs have done some individual good, but they have not done much in changing things and the challenges don't remain the same. And therefore we have to identify the programs. We have to do programs in a way that will have impact on the community. Um, Prof Clayton is open remarks have, you know, indicated clearly. We have to ensure that the money is spent in the areas that are challenged and to provide the transformation required and we need to monitor it. So you have to first get the baseline data. Basic things, and you know, we, we use the term academic and those listening with us assume what mean by baseline data. Um, I take a poor community, illiteracy is a, is a big problem. Kids leave school, cannot read and write, and we spend millions on education, millions on social intervention in the same community. And I find that when you go into community, nobody pays attention to literacy that way. Illiteracy in a particular, the level of numerous in a particular school in a challenge area is 20% for the past 20 years at grade four level. That to me is negligence by those who are monitoring. So nobody monitors. Everybody do a back to school, everybody do something nice, give a uniform to some child here or there. But the school remains the same and the results remain the same. And therefore we have to spend the money we have, but we must move in a new direction. Um, the government has already adopted a policy to mainstream most of its expenditure, which means that we will education will have to be examined. And we get the baseline data, we must get improvement in the schools that serve these areas. That's the first thing, the quality of public health, the quality of the social services these people who are in need, it must be there and we can measure it. It's easily measurable. Nutritional status of kids are well known, the educational achievement can be established, and the quality of housing can be known. So we can measure all of those things. And unless we approach all the expenditure that way, we are not going to. And it has to go through, and this is where we may have a little variant on the report. The expenditure will go to the main core ministries, agencies of government must do their work. We cannot put an education program to a project or something different. The schools must be monitored, evaluated, and if not performing, we have to change the law to change them. You know, you cannot have infant schools, primary schools, secondary schools, when you look at social work. A high school in an area with turning out no CXC, no graduate, nobody can work, yet they have 100 staff members, a principal, a huge physical infrastructure. That's where we have to go. And I said the 
government's commitment is to ensure that the government expenditure is spent efficiently and well, and the products that come in are supportive. Partner funding, it will be going to the Ministry of Finance as it's more budget support now, and then the outcome again measurable. Um, the role of the community-based organization is something that has to be examined because they've been active all these years. How we have to include the community, we have to have buy-in from the community, but we have to look at how we relate to them and the ones that do play an active role. And finally, too much money was spent on building organ institutions to support or to do the work that should be done by the existing institutions. We feel very strongly about that. One project which was very well funded had 68% of its money spent on staffing. That's absolutely ridiculous. And we don't need any new major institutions to do the work to intervene in these communities. We have examined POJ, the Center for Data, data Collection, Data Management to standardize data collection. Could be a registry for social interventions to monitor those who work. CSSP has to do the monitoring. That's their role. But the Ministry of National Security will continue to play a crucial role in looking at the outcome in terms of violence and felony communities. We have to ensure that we work with the police to be a genuine peacekeeping operator law enforcement agency and provide a safe channel for the social workers in these communities. Okay. So we have to intervene. <laughs> okay, so Dr. Chang says we have to intervene, there's no choice. Professor Clayton, suppose we were to just not do any interventions at all? Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> I think that would be coming to the wrong conclusion. You can look at the fact that we've spent hundreds of millions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars, and we haven't touched the problem. And you could say, well, in that case, they're all useless. But that is fact, I think, is not supported uh, by, by what you're saying in this report. What has happened is that the good reports, uh, the good projects, um, are simply um, lost in a sea of useless projects. So it's not to say that there's no point in social intervention. We know, uh, mainly, I have to say, from other countries, that there are social intervention projects which can work extremely well and deliver very good results in a relatively short space of time. The, the problem is that we haven't had that framework in this country. That's the bit that we're missing. So it's not saying let's throw out everything and just go and put all the money into education or something instead. It's really saying let's have a proper system for screening everything that we're doing and actually seeing how much money is being spent on staffing how much is going on the, on the field work that really matters? What is it being spent on? What did it set out to achieve? And has it achieved it? And if it hasn't achieved it at the end of, say, a year or whatever you say, all right, we either have to fix this or else we shut this down. And then the money can be reallocated to the projects that do appear to be getting some traction. If we don't have that management system in place, an impartial management system in place, then what we will do is we'll go on doing exactly what we have been doing, which is throwing money at a problem in the hope that it will go away. And although we, we touched on this, it is true that <laughs> I know that the minister has said that he's had pushback on this, and I have too. There have been some people who got very upset when I said, said that a lot of our social interventions are useless because there are people who get their living from this thing. There are people who get, um, who are on payrolls of NGOs or again, consultancies and so forth. And if you look at the reports that have been written, there's not one of them, I cannot find one, that says that we spent a lot of money on this program and it achieved nothing. Every single report, project report I've ever read said that this project was a great success. And we know that's not true. So what this suggests is that we have a lot of people in the system who have an interest in not reporting the truth. So this is why we need an independent body with some rock solid integrity and in completely impartial that's going to run the same tape measure over every project and say, is this working or is it not working? If it's working, great, let's back it. If it's not working, let's terminate it as quickly as possible and reallocate the funding. Okay. Joe, rather than have you add to that, I want to get to the question of transparency because there are several questions about transparency. 
um, that have been coming in on Slido. I'm going to combine a few of them so that we can get to it. I'm going to ask you to go first, Joe, and then pass the questions on to the other panelists. But the general gist of the questions is, why are government interventions so unwilling to be transparent about their monitoring and evaluation strategies? A, B, why should any intervention share its information? And C, what to me is the most important question here, and this is particularly where I'd like Minister and Professor Clayton to come in, is how can citizens demand greater transparency in interventions? Okay, thank you, Diana. So, as it relates to the unwillingness to share information, and um, in that respect, we end up with transparency issues, it, I believe it comes from the fact we still have a very almost bureaucratic system. Now, one of the things that the report mentions is something called knowledge rules. And this speaks to the fact that people should be able, should from the onset know their roles within the grand scheme of things. If it is that a person is within a certain position, then the information should be shared. Now, as it speaks to the full, the full, the whole of government <laughs> uh, issue of transparency, uh, I think it really comes down to the fact that people are just not quite sure about what it is that they are able to share and perhaps fair repercussions if it is that they are inadvertently revealing something that should not be revealed and what what those consequences are for them. Now, as to why transparency is needed, as I mentioned in the report, as in the presentation, it comes down to the fact that citizens in the interest of good governance should be able to access information about various aspects of a government or of uh, some intervention taking place because it may directly or directly affect them. There's also the reason for accountability. One of the things that has become quite transparent is that, <laughs> no pun intended, uh, is that accountability is also a challenge. Uh, when we talk about the fact that we are here in terms of not knowing which interventions work. Why haven't they worked? Who should be held accountable for the fact that we don't know what works? And especially where taxpayers' money is being funneled into social change in the hundreds of billions, and that's just for a decade, it should be that persons are able to access the information about how their money is being spent. Uh, the latter part of the question, I think you were directing. Yes, so Professor Clayton. Professor Clayton, how can citizens, people who are watching this presentation, who are engaging and want to engage, how does an ordinary person demand more transparency and in interventions? Well, you know, Diana, it never ceases to amaze me that I, this is actually our money. They said these are our tax dollars, which we are giving to the government. The government is then responsible for spending that money wisely in the best interest of everybody. But we can't find out. We actually have, you know, it's really difficult to find out um, very much about many areas of government expenditure. And this is really just a fundamental problem. It undermines so much of what we're trying to do. We really have to have a culture of accountability. And one of the simplest and most effective ways to do that is put everything online. Actually have statements of government expenditure, programs, targets, indicators, and deadlines. Just the basic information that you would use to run any business. The government is the biggest business in Jamaica. 
and it's it <laughs> it reveals less than companies a thousandth of the size now this really has to change in this in every other area we need to know what our money is being spent on for what end and was that end achieved mm -hmm. this really calls for again the kind of bilateral consensus that we were able to build with the crime consensus plan we had the need for greater transparency in public life where there is inadequate insufficient transparency corruption and flourishes and incompetence persists the great thing about transparency is it helps to get these evils out of our political system um dr chang from a practical perspective how can citizens get you and your ministry to be more transparent and share more information um, about the interventions that we as taxpayers are paying for. And not only just that we're paying for it, to my mind, accountability is not just accounting for the money that is spent, but these interventions are meant to impact our lives as well. So if it is to be trying to create a greater, a better space, a safer space for citizen security, I would like to know what is being done to create that space. Yeah. yeah two areas of transparency that we should examine and how we do it as well. We need to, how, how, we, how we discuss transparency as a, as a process. One is, of course, what you may call the fiduciary response, transparency, which is how we spend the money. The budget is apparent, it's now online, and that's why we get some partners funding us through the budget. And you can go online and find, you know, what is budgeted for in education. Each school has a certain budget, and that is easily accessible. In fact, very few people take an interest in it, unfortunately. And the second is, of course, the program transparency. A lot of times things are announced to be done for a community and the community themselves know very little about it and things are going. So I think we have to look at both areas. And I think we, are, we might be going many leaders and at the leadership level, including political NGOs and professionals who have an interest in gender transparency tend to speak from their own platform. And we see it in their own eyes. If you come into a challenged community, very few people in that community know what they really want. They, if, you, if you design a program that will help them, they'll understand it. But they really don't know what to ask for. They don't know where to look. And we keep saying citizen, but the citizens we are talking to in this kind of program is not the citizens who we really need to talk to. Most of them, in fact, have an established agenda, interest. They speak from a service center with a service club, a church group, or an NGO, they are not the people we need to talk. And that's who we address when we say citizens involvement. If those of us who are at this leadership level, they want to change, when programs are announced, we get in the community and educate the community as to what to expect. We need to get the young, the families that are, in, that are out there that are, you know, depressed, a single mother who has four kids and she leaves them every day with the five-year-old to feed the one the bottle of sugar and water to go and hustle on the street we need to get them in the room let them know that there's acts what the path program is about it's for them not us and it's not for us to look at a budget and read a line item to let those they need to take a pause we need to find the social worker get them involved and get them registered get the kids birth certificates get them into the health clinics to know vaccines and nutritional benefits and then they can begin to think about the station. And when you tell them, look, government is spending $100 million on this school where your kids should go to. But I can't go because I have gangster down the road. So we need to get the police to make a safe path for them. And then they go to school to they learn to read and write. And then begin to feel that they're part of society. Because they begin to acquire, restore their self-esteem. They get the school uniform. Because government has a role to do that. Kids are not going to school because they're hungry. And they're not on path. You know, they, 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 they don't have a uniform. There is facilities to provide that. The, the people who need it don't know. And oftentimes, even with transparency, we get someone who is quite smart, look at the budget, this is being spent here, this is being spent there, but nothing reaches the people who should reach. We don't need additional workers. We need the people who are employed in government to do the work. We need to put in appropriate monitoring and evaluation and that's the major program that needs to be done. I will not support another bureaucracy to do coordination. Government must work. The citizen security business 
group is all the permanent secretaries chaired by the prime minister all the heads of agencies and they'll be effectively monitored and part of the ministry's role will be to do just that you know we unfortunately the ministry of national security get the end results nobody sees it nobody else feels. we see the dead bodies on a daily basis across jamaica we see the blood every policeman sees it we know the challenge we know who ends up there we know the young man who want, didn't want to join the gang but he was forced to join the gang we are going to monitor that because that's what we're going to change no police officer in this country want to keep arresting his peers that's who they arrest young police officer joined the force at 18 and 34 and the job is to go there and lock up 18 to 34. it is not their desire it is not their ambition they want to see a peaceful secure country with safety and the kids going to school and getting a better life and that's what we're going to monitor and do so we need we if i a closing band is that for citizens' transparency, we need to educate the people who are supposed to get the benefits so that they can do the monitoring. If I go into a community and I'm building a road and I want this amount built, I've had people call me and say, Dr. Chan, the amount of building material on this road is not right. And I have it checked by engineers and I get it done. The citizens must be educated, not just transparent. We have to, as leaders, educate our citizens what they are deserving us in their dollar and i think bodies like the work you do can be transmitted to a lot of the goodwill bodies from churches to ngos to public servants so, Dr. Chang, that you're going to instruct your mns staff to upload all of the intervention documents to the mns website so researchers like us can have access to them as well as because the researcher should have the data so we can do objective independent analysis this, we have not done this over the years i said how can we as a country be paying we have schools in a community and we constantly turn out of that school people are functionally illiterate and numerate over a 10-year period and it can be changed overnight i've seen it and i have seen it in my own constituency some hard schools principal gets in, applies herself, we give them support. And in three years, everybody's getting placed in high school. It is not difficult. We can transform this country in five years if everybody cooperate and understand the service that we provide is for those humble people in need of court service. And I mean the main services, education, health. You know, without seeking to upset my teacher, my teaching friends, my wife's the teacher, and so I'm the friends. But in many ways, the Ministry of Education function more that like an employment agency for teachers rather than a service to poor kids. The issues being discussed all the time is the condition, not the results, is the conditions of service. Now teachers should be well paid and they should have a but it's very rarely you get a discussion, an open discussion, and the ministry used to publish it. The documentary tells you what each school has every year, literacy and numeracy at, in at grade four. Have any of you ever heard this discussed publicly? Have anybody listening to this program had a full discussion on the school in their community, what their grade has been over the last 10 years and what we expect of them? It's not discussed, it's published and it's like a, a piece of newspaper you read today and show it away tomorrow. That's the thing that we should be discussing in education. There's no school where you have a full staff member, a physically quality school repaired in the good order, where you should have illiteracy coming out of the school at grade six consistently year after year after year that's the failure we need to correct i think we can correct it thank you i can't believe it but the time has actually run out on us and we have so many questions and so what i'm going to do is just for this last round just to ask each of the panelists starting with joanna um then to Professor Clayton, I'm going to give Minister the last word <laughs> to just give a one minute, share some thoughts on everything that we have talked about this evening, um, the report and where we need to be really going in terms of social interventions, anti-violence interventions, interventions for at-risk youth. We all agree that they're the main target group or ought to be. We all agree that what we've been doing hasn't worked. We all agree that we don't know if they work um, or the extent to which they work or haven't worked because we don't have the frameworks. Where do we go from here, Joanna? 
Well, I think we're at a pivotal point right now. Uh, Professor Clayton mentioned the national consensus on crime. Uh, the government, in the prime minister also convened the National Commission on Violence Prevention to look at social interventions. And we have the Citizen Security Secretary being set up. I do believe that we are at a pivotal point where if it is that we take the steps that are necessary to start stringent monitoring and evaluation, uh, the coordinated efforts, uh, you know, whatever comes out of the National Convention on Violence uh, Prevention Report and the establishment of the Citizen Security Secretary, the political push of the national crime consensus, I think if there's ever a moment that we can really push for the change in the culture for monitoring and evaluation, it is now. I think all the stars are lined up. And if it is that once we can begin to engage the stakeholders, both non-governmental and governmental, to convene together to decide upon you know, definitions to decide upon, you know, how their social intervention can best assist in the social change. I do think that we would have a chance somewhere down the line of implementing and creating a monitoring evaluation situation that would allow us to then start doing what we need to do, which is to monitor the social interventions for at-risk youth who participate in crime and violence. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Tony, your last minute thoughts. Okay, thank you, Diana. We keep trying to use our police to solve our crime problem. But, police, but the underlying issues are actually social, economic, and cultural. And the police can't solve those kinds of problems. One of the things that happens, if you have young children who are exposed to physical, emotional, sexual abuse, who are traumatized, who've seen several homicides while they're still very, very young. You get structural changes in the brain. They are much, much more likely to have attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. And studies done elsewhere have found that if you compare the prison population with the general population, the level of ADHD is about 10 times higher in the prison population. So what this means is that we have broken families who are raising broken children. And those children are very, very much more likely to end up either in gangs or in jail, or in many cases as sex workers. And if we don't break that cycle, then we are going to be dealing with these problems for many, many years to come. This is not a problem that the police can solve. This is a problem that requires social intervention. Our director of public prosecution said recently that a lot of our worst child sex abuse cases cluster, three clusters in Jamaica, and each one of them revolves around a particular school. There's a pattern there of damaged families, that children who are abused in childhood are much more likely to become abusers themselves when they're adults. And so the cycle goes down the generations. We have to find effective interventions to break that cycle. This is why the Ministry of National Security cannot solve this problem by itself. This is why we need a whole of government approach. And this is why we need social interventions. We need to stop wasting money on social interventions that don't work because we really need that money to spend on the social interventions that will work and do work and can help us to actually solve these problems before they become problems. Okay, thank you. Minister, your last minute of thoughts. Um, well, we have a major problem. Um, results, reviews, will show, data will show that some 42% of our boys are not interested in much of what our education system at this point in time. I own surveys in the urban areas, which we call challenge communities, show up to 70% and they drop out of school by grade nine with little interest in what's happening in the schools. They have said so and we meet them personally. So we have a major challenge we need to do. And I, I like to use the word now, profitation as social investment. 
I use the term investment, I get a better response in terms of the need to monitor, evaluate, and learn. You see intervention, there's a good work to go in and do something. Investment is something you do to and look for a return. And that means examining your investment on an ongoing basis. And that is which direction the government is moving. Um, not much was said of Citizen Business Group, the, the, yeah, which is maybe the more critical program as opposed to the Secretariat. The, this, the business group is what is consists of the, all permanent secretaries, all heads of agencies. Effectively, its chairman is the prime minister as deputy I chair it functionally. And that's the group that we have to work with to ensure that the coordination and the mainstreaming of social investment occurs and occurs in efficient way. That's where we get lost. Whatever program you do and whoever monitors the work, it's the MDs of government that mean the main, the, um, the you know, central government and development agencies do not work together on the same plate, it will not be sustainable. In fact, they will work around very easily. Much of that money referred to, which is designed to ensure better quality education, good better quality nutrition, essentially to ice, to remove the social isolation of what inner city people who feel they don't have a stake in society. They no, there's no future for them. What I know, I'm, I've learned a new word from the, um, the, the, the social workers, the social Anthropologists, ontological security. There is no self-esteem. There is no sense of, you know, individuality. We have to restore their self-respect, their self-esteem, and in particular, a young boys, but all those inner-city families which are being, you know, socially dysfunctional, and we have to get the baseline data. When I did the first survey in Montego Bay and found 76 percent of our boys dropped out of grade nine, I could not believe it. And that was from a professional social worker who went in host to host, came out. But when I got, got that, I realized there was no surprise that I had the most gang in Montego Bay and that there, when you get in that kind of gangsterism, there was also a high level of felon and criminality around it. And many of the young men who were, some of them, my friends I walked with in the days, they were transforming the night because their source of power was to go out and basically seek their way of living at that time. The baseline data is important. That's the first thing I've asked for that. Anything we're doing must tell me what is happening in the community. As term I have used, the social demographic data. How many young, how many children in there? How many single parents? How many going to school? How many assurance? How many other, you know, um, what is the quality of education? What is the quality of health status? So we get into a community and find 40% lack of immunization. That means they are not even going to health clinic. So, object of all our work well, must be ensure we can get that data and take steps to execute programs to change that, including working with the police to as providers of public safety and peace rather than gangsters. That's where we're heading. The government is committed to executing our program and the last word and time is up. I must say that. Why should the people who are listening believe it's going to change? Because as I said, we have established the business grouping of government, which involves all the leadership in government and directed by the Prime Minister and myself to ensure that agencies work together and the taxpayers' money is spent efficiently and well to achieve the outcome we are seeking. Thank you. I'm going to turn back over to Nicole, who is going to wrap up. But thank you, Minister. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Joanna. I think this is a very stimulating discussion and especially the Questions coming in on Slido certainly showed there was a very high level of interest. Nicole, over to you. Thank you, Diana. We are grateful to the EU for their funding of this project and the report that was launched this evening. We're also very thankful to our Gold Circle sponsors whose contribution support the work of Capri. Thanks also to our panelists, Minister Chang and Professor Clayton for your contribution this evening. And to the audience who participated via Slido, thanks for the engaging questions. I know that the questions, many of your questions have been answered in our report, which is available on our website, caprecaribbean.org. Please join us on June 8th, when we'll be launching another EU funded report, which is on mental health in youth in Jamaica. Thank you. 